Hey there, Wooly. Bob, a co-worker, quipped, a sly grin spreading across his face. Looking extra round today. Willow responded with a smile as she sat at her desk, masking the twinge of irritation that lingered beneath the surface. Willow chimed in Bob's office bestie. No kidding. They actually went around calling themselves each other's bestie. Frank, did you lose some weight? She sighed inwardly. No, Frank. She replied, her tone even. Still the same as yesterday. Such was the unremarkable routine of Willow's daily life. And during fat jokes and flying under the radar for her work, her colleagues had given her a variety of nicknames. Wally, Willie, Wynn, seemingly anything that started with AW. Most days, she chose to wear a smile as her armor. Willow had always been the type to deflect negativity with a grin. She'd been a chubby child navigating adolescence with the same burden, and now as an adult, she had settled into the role of the big girl. So Willow had grown used to people's remarks. Did she wish that people would see beyond her body type and recognize her for who she truly was? Of course, but she had learned the hard way that when you deviated from the societal norm of body size, certain expectations came with it. Suddenly, a snap brought Willow back to reality. Did you take a trip to Layla Land? Tina snapped her fingers impatiently, her signature annoyed expression directed squarely at Willow, the signature look that was reserved exclusively for Willow. Anyone else would receive a warm smile? Tina! Willow exclaimed, abruptly rising from her chair. Judging by the stern expression on Tina's face, it was evident that she hadn't stopped by for casual conversation. Well, not that Tina ever sought out Willow for idle chit-chat, but you know, it was worth mentioning. With a resounding thud, she dropped a file onto her desk. Check your mail. Leroy needs an ad for their new diamond collection. I don't expect you to present it, but since you'll be sitting in on the meeting, you should at least have an understanding of what it's all about. Deep inside, Willow felt a bubbling rush of excitement. It wasn't the company's first collaboration with Leroy, but it had only been over a year since she started working at the advertisement company, so it was her first time experiencing it. What's more, Diamonds had always held a special place in her heart. According to Willow, everyone's life was just like that of a diamond shining and unique and she, as a special heavy diamond, had an extra high value. This unique perspective fueled her enthusiasm, so even though her work wouldn't be seen, just being on the project filled her with delight. Okay. Willow began to respond, but Tina didn't wait to listen before briskly walking away. Her next target was Christine, except Tina liked Christine. In fact, everyone in the office liked Christine. Even Willow liked her. Among the sea of colleagues, only two treated Willow like a regular human being, and Christine was one of them. Tina's face lit up with a radiant smile as she reached Christine's desk. Panda Keys loved the work you did for them. They're considering your services again. Christine's gratitude was apparent in her response, and she turned to Willow with a thankful smile. Willow had in fact helped her on that project. A lot. Willow acknowledged her with a thumbs up before refocusing on her work, delving into the contents of the file Tina had delivered, and carefully reviewing the mail to note all the client's desires and specifications. With a clear vision in mind, Willow embarked on crafting the perfect AD. Her concept revolved around beauty and difference, intending to emphasize the unique qualities of Leroy's diverse range of diamonds, allowing each gem to radiate in its distinct manner. Meanwhile, she had another pending ad to complete for a makeup brand. Hey, Willow, how's it going? Christine was undoubtedly the most attractive woman in the workplace, but her charm extended beyond her looks. It was an unspoken rule in the office that if Christine didn't like you, you would be ignored. Good, Christine. Thanks. Willow replied, expecting the conversation to end there. However, as Christine lingered by her desk, Willow couldn't help but glance at her in confusion. Do you need something? Oh. If Christine were a diamond, she would undoubtedly be the idol's eye, radiating an irresistible allure. And, of course, she sported distinctive blue hair that made her stand out like the gem. It's time for the meeting with Leroy. Willow sprang to her feet, startled by the realization that she had lost track of time while engrossed in the Leroy ad and the makeup brand project. Damn, thanks, Christine. Christine smiled and extended an invitation to walk together, a gesture that Willow gladly accepted. If they walked into the meeting room together, Tina wouldn't glare at her much. 
Upon entering the meeting room, Willow noticed that Tina and a few other colleagues were already seated. Willow led the way, but before Tina could reprimand her, Christine followed closely behind. Tina shot Willow a disapproving look, but refrained from uttering any further remarks. Willow couldn't help but think, a win, as she settled into a seat on the left side of Tina, with Christine occupying the seat on her right. Tina, her smile strained, leaned toward Willow and whispered, Don't speak, just watch! Willow responded with a subtle nod. Just then, the door swung open, and the atmosphere in the meeting room shifted as all eyes turned toward the entrance. In walked Caspian Leroy, CEO of Leroy, accompanied by a team of three individuals. Welcome, sir. The entire room chorused in unison as they rose from their seats to acknowledge him. However, Caspian wasted no time with pleasantries. Uh, Tina, what do you have for me? He asked, going straight to the point. The room fell silent, awaiting Tina's response. Tina got up from her seat and, with determination in her stride, moved to the front of the room and plugged a USB drive into the projector. I'll play the video, sir, she announced confidently. As the ad played, all eyes in the room were glued to the screen. However, when the video ended, Caspian's expression, once neutral, had soured into one of displeasure. Asked it, where's the flair? Where's the shine, the uniqueness? He asked, his tone carrying a distinct note of disappointment. Tina's confidence wavered as she took in Caspian's reaction, and her once bright smile began to falter, mirroring the tension that now permeated the room. We? Well, Tina stammered. Caspian, clearly unsatisfied, rose from his seat with a decisive tone. If that's all you have for me, then Ligo I will have to use the services of another ad company. Violently observing the situation unfold, Willow suddenly jumped up from her seat, her voice breaking the silence as she exclaimed, Wait, we have something else. Tina gritted her teeth in frustration. No, we don't. Willow met her panicked gaze, which silently urged her not to take any rash actions, but Willow paid it no heed. Unfazed, Willow asserted with a confident smile. Yes, we do. With a USB drive in hand, Willow marched to the front of the room, disregarding the snickers and smirks from her colleagues as she accidentally bumped into a few of them. She removed Tina's USB and inserted her own. The screen displayed the words beauty and difference as the new advertisement began to play. The room fell into a hushed silence as they watched the ad, with everyone keeping a close eye on Caspian's reaction. At the end of the video, Caspian turned to Willow and asked, How'd you make this? Tina, trying to take credit for Willow's work, quickly interjected. I did. I worked with Willow to make this. It's true. Bob and his bestie Frank chimed in with supporting comments for Tina. Willow looked at them with wide, questioning eyes. While they weren't particularly close colleagues, wasn't there supposed to be a code of solidarity among co-workers? Then, she turned pleading eyes toward Christine, who averted her gaze with a meek expression. It became clear to Willow this was how it was going to be. Tina began to speak again, but before she could say another word, Caspian cut her off with a firm. I wasn't talking to you, Tina. He redirected his attention to Willow, pressing on with his inquiry. Um, did you make this? Willow nodded vigorously, her heart racing with a mix of nervousness and relief. Yes, sir. I made this ad. Caspian's decision was swift as he turned to Tina, announcing, Leroy will go with this ad. Then, his focus shifted back to Willow, and he proposed. How about we talk about this over dinner? Give me your business card, and I'll contact you. With a stutter, Willow agreed. Yes, yes sir. I think I'm in love. It was 7 p.m., and Willow had just gotten off work and was back at the house she shared with her best friend, Raymond. They lounged on his couch, indulging in a spread of junk food. Raymond raised an eyebrow, an amused smile playing on his lips. Again? When? This happens every other week. Willow playfully hit Raymond with a pillow a couple of times. I swear it's serious this time. His eyes twinkled as he laughed. You say that every time. Her best friend for most of her life, Willow didn't know what she would do without him. If Willow were to compare him to a diamond, he would be a princess diamond. He was very charming and had the sparkly eyes to match, too. Rolling her eyes, Willow shot back. You're just a hater. Playfully sticking her tongue out at her friend, she couldn't help but notice the irony in his comment, considering that her best friend always had a new woman in his bed every week. He was even more hopeless than she was. It had only been a few hours since she'd met Caspian Leroy, but Willow was absolutely convinced that she was in love with him. Scratch that, she knew she was in love with him. 
After the way he had stood up for her at the meeting, she couldn't think of anything else. Raymond, intrigued by Willow's infatuation, asked, When? This is him, right? Caspian Leroy? Willow leaned over to peer at Raymond's phone screen, which displayed a picture of Caspian from an online search. Hmm. I mean, I know visuals aren't everything, but look at that face. Raymond arched an eyebrow, a mischievous grin playing on his lips. So, you admit to liking him only because he has a pretty face? His teasing was all in good fun, and Willow was well aware of that, but a tinge of irritation at herself simmered beneath the surface. She knew firsthand what it felt like to be judged solely based on one's appearance. Whether people were looking at you because you were conventionally attractive or not so conventionally attractive, it didn't always feel good. Raymond quickly noticed a subtle shift in Willow's expression and hastened to clarify. You know I'm just kidding. Willow let out a laugh. Sure, he has a pretty face, but it's the way he stood up for me that made me fall for him, right? Gosh. I wish I had a recording of Tina's face when it happened. It was priceless. Raymond grinned at the thought. I bet. So what kind of diamond would Caspian Leroy be? He asked, popping an Oreo into his mouth. Willow had thought about this on the ride home from work. The Carbonado Diamond had come to mind, popularly referred to as the Black Diamond. It was striking and had a dark allure and intrigue, just like Caspian Leroy. He hadn't judged her because of how she looked and actually gave her a chance. Raymond rose from the couch, collecting the empty soda bottles scattered on the floor as he made his way to the kitchen. We need ice cream. Willow called out after him. Raymond chuckled, his voice drifting from the kitchen. No, we don't, but we're going to have it anyway. Willow couldn't help but grin and let out a cheer. So? Raymond continued from the kitchen. Why did you decide to go against Tina today? It's not the first time she's taken credit for your work. Heck, your co-workers leech off you every time, but you've never complained. Not to them, anyway. Willow contemplated for a moment, her thoughts going back to what happened. Mom, I don't know. Maybe it's because there were diamonds involved. Probably that, but also because of the look on Caspian's face. What do you mean? Raymond's curiosity was piqued. Willow settled into the couch, her eyes fixed on the television. Well, he came in looking so uninterested, right? Kinda like he expected to be disappointed. Raymond nodded, trying to follow her line of thought. I see. She couldn't help but laugh as she toggled through the TV channels. Do you? Raymond returned from the kitchen, cradling a massive tub of ice cream in his hands. Not really, but I guess. Willow continued her quest to find something worth watching as she changed channels. Enough about me. How was work? Raymond placed the ice cream on the coffee table and exhaled a tired sigh. I've seen better days. I need something to forget. Understanding the weight of his profession as a surgeon, Willow nodded sympathetically. While Raymond didn't often share the details of his work with her, she had a general sense of what he faced. Ice cream and a bad reality show is all we need to forget, right? She raised a spoon and gestured for Raymond to do the same. Her best friend laughed, raised his spoon, and clinked it against hers. Heck yeah. Just as she was about to take a bite of the creamy goodness, Willow's phone began to ring. It was from an unknown number. Hello? Willow answered the call. Hello, is this Willow? The voice on the other end slurred slightly, but that deep baritone sounded a little familiar. Yes, this is her. She confirmed. This is Caspian Leroy. Willow practically jumped to her feet upon hearing his name. Hello, hello, Mr. Leroy. She stammered, taking her phone away from her ear to glance at the time. It was approaching 9 p.m., and Caspian Leroy's voice hinted that he had indulged in a few drinks. Do you know the club, Bevo Isis? Caspian's voice slurred slightly. Willow, still reeling from the call, turned to Raymond with wide eyes and mouth. Do you know Vervo Oasis? He nodded. Yes, sir. Willow replied to Caspian. Meet me there as soon as you can. Caspian instructed, and then abruptly ended the call. Willow whipped around to face Raymond, her mind racing. Verve Oasis, what kind of club is it? It's an elite club for the cream of society. Politicians, celebrities, you name it. With a surge of excitement and nervous energy, Willow dashed to her room. Raymond followed her. What are you doing? He asked. Caspian asked me to meet him there. I have to find something to wear. 
Willow explained as she delved into her wardrobe, searching for the perfect outfit. It's 9 p.m. Raymond pointed out, his expression a mix of concern and disbelief. Are you seriously considering going out to meet this stranger? You just met at an unfamiliar place? Willow paused her wardrobe search, facing Raymond with unwavering determination. Technically, he's my company's client. If he asks for me, I need to go meet him. She paid no mind to the incredulous looks her friend was giving her and eventually pulled out a shimmery silver dress with a daringly low split, which she held up for Raymond to see. You said this made me look like a diamond. Raymond looked dumbfounded for a moment before managing to sputter. Well, yeah. That's enough for me. Willow interrupted. Also, could you call me a cab? Raymond hesitated for a moment, his concern evident in his gaze. Are you sure about this, Win? Willow nodded. At this moment, she had never been more certain about anything in her life. A few minutes later, Willow found herself in a cab, dressed in her shimmering silver dress and matching shoes, en route to Vervoasis. To her dismay, she was greeted by unexpected late-night traffic as hordes of people headed home, so it took her two hours to get to her destination. When she arrived, Willow reached for her phone, intending to call Caspian to inform him of her arrival. However, as she stood at the entrance of the club, a familiar figure staggered out of the building. Sir! She rushed toward him just in time to catch him before he fell. Are you, you're, are you, you, you? He slurred, his words accompanied by a belch that reeked of alcohol. A valet, noticing the situation, hurried over to them. Are you Mr. Leroy's company? He asked me to take him back to his hotel after the party. Are you coming with him? Willow was conflicted. She didn't want to leave Caspian alone in this state. But the idea of accompanying him was also far from appealing. She hesitated, torn between her sense of responsibility and her reservations. Miss? The valet regarded her with a questioning look. With a determined nod, Willow replied. Yes? She then sent a message to Raymond, informing him that the party had ended and she would be staying at a hotel since it was late. She deliberately omitted the part about going with Caspian, not wanting to cause her friend unnecessary worry. They weren't going to stay in the same room anyway. She would try to get another room. Raymond's response came quickly, offering to come and pick her up. No, it's fine. Eat all the ice cream. Watch some television and get some sleep. Mua, love you. She added a heart emoji at the end. Willow turned her attention back to the valet. I'll go with him. It wasn't going to be like the movies where the female lead undressed the male lead. She was going to make sure he gotten safely, then leave. The hotel was only a short drive away from Verve Oasis, and the valet provided Willow with a card that granted access to one of the hotel rooms. With a sense of apprehension, Willow led a passed out Caspian to the room and dumped him on the bed. Just as she was about to leave, she heard Caspian's voice pierce through the stillness of the room. Maggie. He mumbled, sitting up on the bed and gazing at Willow with vacant eyes. Stay. Willow pointed to herself, confused. Caspian nodded and flopped back onto the bed. Her inner voice screamed that she shouldn't be doing this, but against her better judgment, Willow lay down beside Caspian. She had intended to remain there until he fell asleep, or so she thought. The following morning, Willow stirred from her slumber as someone shook her gently. Miss Willow, get up. She blinked her groggy eyes open to find Caspian standing beside the bed, his expression one of disgust as he regarded her. There was a sinking feeling as she realized she had fallen asleep the previous night, and it was now morning. Caspian's tone was cold as he ordered, I've called a cab for you. Leave. Willow couldn't find the words to respond. She quickly gathered her phone and purse by the side of the bed and ran out of the hotel room. When Willow arrived at work on Monday morning, she was in for the shock of her life. Tina wants to see you in her office. Christine was waiting for her at her desk and informed her the moment she walked in. Willow couldn't look past the fact that the usual warm smile that Christine always had for her was absent today. Of course, she had noticed that since the incident with the Leroy Diamond ad, Christine hadn't sent her any of the Instagram reels they usually shared. Was she mad at Willow for standing up for herself? Despite her unease, Willow managed to force a smile and told Christine. Thanks, Christine. Thankfully, Bob and Frank weren't in their seats, so she headed towards Tina's office, her heart pounding with anticipation. When Willow knocked on Tina's office door and walked in, she found the woman sitting in a swivel chair. 
her back turned toward the entrance, she hid a smile, suspecting that Tina was aiming for a dramatic entrance, and right on cue, Tina swiveled around dramatically, wearing a smile. The smile fell from Willow's face as her mind raced with confusion. Had hell frozen over? Had she somehow stumbled into an alternate universe? Why was Tina smiling at her? It wasn't a very welcoming smile, but still. Willow? Winnie. Tina greeted her with a smile that could only be described as unnerving. Willow couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. Yes, Tina. Sit. Reluctantly, Willow took a seat and braced herself for whatever Tina had to stay. About the Leroy Diamond Collection, you're off the project. Just like that. What? Willow was taken aback, shock coursing through her. I hate to have to do this, really. Tina continued, though the wide smile contradicted her words. But we had a meeting. A meeting? Willow hadn't been informed about any meeting. Also, when did this happen? In decided that since you haven't been here long and you don't have much experience, you're not qualified to do this. Tunned and disbelieving, Willow sat there trying to wrap her head around Tina's words. What was going on? Tina must have conveniently forgotten the role Willow played in helping her co-workers with their ads. All the while, she had quietly shouldered the burdens of their work and helped them get promoted, all without receiving any recognition for her contributions. This unjust treatment was about to come to an end today. No, no. Willow replied firmly. Tina's smile visibly faltered. No? With newfound confidence, Willow rose from her seat, her determination shining through. My ad got picked. She declared with conviction, pointing to herself. Not yours, not Christine's, not anyone else's, mine. I'm going to work on the Leroy ad and there's nothing you can do about it. Little did she realize how wrong that statement would turn out to be. To Willow's astonishment, Tina began to laugh. I tried to give you the easy way out, but since this is how you want to do it. She reached into her drawer and produced a single file, then pushed it across the table toward Willow. At the top of the file, in bold letters, was the phrase letter of termination. Shock coursed through Willow as Tina's words sank in. She protested. Tina! Tina, you can't just do this. But Tina remained resolute. Actually, I can. The older woman stood up, walked to the door, and gestured for Willow to leave. Anger began to replace shock in Willow's emotions. She snatched the termination letter from the desk and strode toward Tina. You'll regret this. She warned, her voice trembling with anger. Just so you know, I've always thought of you as a board. You'll never be able to do anything without me. Remember that, when you lose all your clients... Willow fought back tears as she walked back to her desk, repeating to herself, Willow, don't you cry. Don't give them the satisfaction of seeing you cry. Bob and Frank were back at their cubicles, and when they saw her approaching, they began to snicker. So predictable. As for Christine, she didn't even meet her eyes. The scrapbook she was working on must have been really important. Pushing her co-workers to the back of her mind, Willow gathered her belongings. There weren't many personal items on her desk and had no issue leaving them behind. He grabbed her purse and without a single glance at her soon-to-be ex-co-workers, walked out of the office, leaving behind a chapter of her life she was more than ready to close. As Willow made her way to the bus stop, she pulled out her phone and dialed Raymond's number. She knew he wasn't on call at hospital today, and she desperately needed someone to talk to. Hey, Wynn. Raymond answered with a hint of humor in his voice. Do you have enough time that you can call me during work hours? Despite his joking tone, Willow's emotions were already on edge, and her feelings were fragile. She stopped by the side of the road and, unable to contain her emotions any longer, burst into tears. Raymond! She knew she was attracting the attention of Passersby, but at that moment, she was too drained to care. Hey, hey, what's going on? Worry laced Raymond's voice as he asked. Willow, what happened? I got fired. Willow managed to choke out between hiccups as the tears continued to stream down her face. The reality of losing her job had hit her like a ton of bricks, and it was all because she had finally stood up for herself. Throughout her time working for Tina, Willow had been content to let her co-workers take credit for her work, but the moment she asserted herself, she'd been fired. Willow had always been somewhat of an outsider among her co-workers. On one hand, they asked her for help with their designs and ads, 
but on the other hand, they often looked down on her because of her weight and appearance. Part of her felt relieved to be free of that environment, but the sadness still weighed heavily on her. Raymond's voice brought her back to the present. Willow, are you there? Yeah. Yeah. She replied, her tears gradually subsiding. I'm just trying to wrap my head around the fact that I've lost my job, Raymond. I really wanted to work on the Diamond Project. I know when. Raymond replied with sympathy. Where are you now? Have you left work? Do you want me to come get you? Willow managed a faint smile. She was grateful to have Raymond as a friend. Yes, I've left. She responded. No, you don't need to come get me. It's your day off, and I'm almost at the bus stop. Watch out! Willow looked up in confusion. Why was there a car on the sidewalk, heading straight toward her? Panic surged through her as she tried to move out of the way, but it was too late. There was a loud collision, and then everything went eerily silent. Willow, when can you hear me? Raymond's voice echoed in her disoriented mind. Then she drifted off. Caspian Leroy was on his way to the advertising company, where Willow worked. After their encounter last Friday night, he had thought about sending an email to Tina, requesting that she reassign the Leroy Diamond project to someone else. It wasn't that he had any issue with her, he just thought it might be awkward for her to work with him after what happened. Ultimately, he decided to visit in person to discuss the matter with Tina. As they neared their destination, his driver, Andrew, slowed the car down, causing Caspian to look at him in confusion. Andrew, why are you slowing down? Sir, I think there's been an accident up ahead. Andrew replied, his tone concerned. Caspian peered out of the car and immediately noticed the crowd of onlookers gathered just a few steps ahead on the sidewalk. Some were busy recording the scene on their phones, while others stood by, and a few leaned over what seemed to be a body sprawled on the pavement. Shards of glass were scattered around, but there was no car with a missing window. It had probably been a hit and run. His concern grew as he surveyed the situation. Why are they just standing around? Have they called an ambulance? Caspian's rhetorical question was met with a quizzical look from Andrew. Do you want me to drive past? No, park the car and call an ambulance. Caspian instructed. I don't think any of these people have actually done so. After Andrew followed his orders and parked the car, Caspian stepped out and approached the scene. He approached one of the bystanders and inquired. Uh, what happened? So... Hit and run. Came the reply. Then the person resumed filming the incident. Caspian was filled with disbelief as he approached the scene. And then as he saw the person laying on the ground, his shock turned into recognition. This was Miss Willow, the same person he had been planning to remove from the Leroy Diamond project. Quickly, he returned to the car and inquired whether Andrew had called an ambulance. They said they would be here in five minutes. That was a couple of minutes ago. I expect they will be here soon. Andrew replied, as if on cue, the wailing sirens of an ambulance filled the air, followed by the arrival of the emergency vehicles. First responders sprang into action, tending to Miss Willow, while police officers gathered statements from witnesses. Does anyone know this young lady? Any friend, family, or co-worker? An EMT asked the crowd. Caspian immediately raised his hand. I do. He moved closer as Willow was moved onto a stretcher. Um, uh, Caspian Leroy, and she works for me. All right, Mr. Caspian, can you come with us to the hospital? For sure. Caspian nodded. I'll follow behind you in my car. And so he did, his concern growing with every second of the drive. As the ambulance arrived at the hospital, Caspian immediately approached the attending doctor, his voice filled with concern. Oh, she'll survive, right? Do everything you can to save her. Whatever the cost, I'll take care of it. The doctor, who introduced herself as Dr. Lin, nodded in assurance as Willow was wheeled off to the operating theater, and Caspian could only hope for the best. One of the EMT who had been on the scene approached him, holding a bag. These are the belongings of the victim. Will you be collecting it? Caspian shook his head. Give it to her when she wakes up. When? Willow heard a familiar voice whispering her name. The only person who ever called her that was Raymond, and he had adopted the nickname when they were young. It was unusual, and when she had asked him about it, he had said he didn't have a specific reason for using it. I think her eyes fluttered. She heard Raymond's voice again. With great effort, Willow managed to open her eyes into tiny slits. The intense brightness of the room made her squint, and she quickly closed her eyes again before gradually opening them again. As her vision adjusted, she realized she was in a hospital room, and there were three people present, one of whom was Raymond. He came forward, gently took her hand, and squeezed it, saying, When? 
As Willow continued to regain her senses, a person she assumed was the doctor came closer with a small flashlight and pointed it into her eyes. Hey Willow, I'm Dr. Lin. How's your head? Does it hurt? Willow managed to shake her head slightly. Face hurts. Her words came out slurred. Dr. Lin offered a smile. I'll get to that in a minute, but your pupils look healthy. Do you know what happened to you? Car! Hit! It hurt to speak. Her entire face hurt. Dr. Lin nodded in acknowledgement. Yes, you were in a car accident. My team and I managed to get you out safely, but there's an issue with your face. A lot of shards from the car got into your face, and I'll be honest with you. Willow, your face is a scarred mess. A whimper escaped Willow's throat, and Raymond squeezed her hand in comfort, Dr. Lin continued. So, I would like to make you an offer. We have some of the best plastic surgeons in this hospital, and Dr. Ami. She pointed to the petite woman in the room with a perfect face. Would like to help in the reconstruction of your face. Also, if you're worried about the cost, I'm happy to tell you that a generous donor has taken care of all your hospital bills. Willow's eyes widened in surprise at the news. She immediately turned to Raymond, thinking he was the donor, but he shook his head. I don't know who it is either, he told her. Apart from that, though, she had a lot of reservations. She had no experience with plastic surgery, so she didn't know what it would entail, what the consequences might be for her life, and whether it would even be successful. As if she could sense Willow's reservations, Dr. Ami stepped closer, standing by the bedside. There might be some complications, but I promise to give your face the best reconstruction. You can trust me with this. Willow turned to her best friend, Raymond, who added, I can vouch for Dr. Amy. She's the best at what she does. With Raymond's vote of confidence, Willow nodded. Okay. Dr. Lin interjected. Dr. Amy will provide you with all the details about the procedure. All right? Willow nodded as Dr. Lin and Raymond left the room, leaving her alone with Dr. Amy. Over the next hour, Dr. Amy explained the entire surgical procedure to Willow in detail. She discussed the potential risks and complications, the expected timeline of the surgery and recovery, and what the final results might look like. Dr. Amy reassured her once more. I understand this is a big decision, Willow, and it's completely up to you. If you need time to think it over, I'm here to support you every step of the way. Decided. I'll do it. As Caspian entered the boardroom, he tried to shake the lingering thoughts about Willow. He had received the news that her surgery had gone well, and that was enough for him. He didn't need to check on her. For now, he needed to focus on the board meeting and the proposal he was presenting today. The board members were already seated and the atmosphere in the room was tense. It had only been a few months since he took over as the CEO of Leroy Company, and it hadn't been a smooth ride. In a few months, this was the second board meeting he was attending. During the first, his position had been challenged by the members, and he had dismissed four of the members. Today, Caspian was going for a bold approach. As his secretary passed around the minutes of the previous meeting and board paper, he took a stand in front of the room and began speaking. Caspian had called the meeting to discuss the company's current standing. Just last month, they had recorded the lowest sales figures the company had ever experienced. I'll get straight to the point. Uh, we've lost uh, quite a few customers, but I'm proposing a project that will increase our sales by 20% in three months. There's a small chance of this happening, but in the case that it does, I'm prepared to take the absolute blame and resign. Ignoring the murmurs from the room, he continued. That'll be all for this meeting. And truly, that was all he had to say. As the board members left the room, the chairman stopped beside Caspian. I hope you know what you're doing. I would hate to see you lose your job. Caspian gave a brisk nod as he acknowledged the man's words. The chairman walked out and went back to his office. Willow was a completely new woman. After the surgery, it had taken over three weeks for her scars to heal. Surprisingly also, the effect of her meds on her body was enormous. In those couple of weeks, she lost a lot of weight. She was still trying to get used to her new face and body when Raymond made a suggestion one cold night. Let's go to a pub. She looked away from the television and to her friend who was already dressed to go out. No. Winnie, you've been cooped up here the entire period of your recovery. It's kind of sad. You need to go out. I just, I don't know if I'm ready yet. She didn't think she could explain to Raymond how she was feeling. 
to have lived with a particular body and face for a good part of your life, suddenly having it changed to something else was not easy to get to. When she looked at herself in the mirror, she saw someone she didn't recognize. Willow was scared that people would see through her and call her an imposter, so she stayed at home where she was safe from prying eyes. Raymond sat across her and folded his legs. I can't understand what it feels like to have your whole appearance change in such a short time. But I know from my experience with patients that you need to go out. To get rid of the imposter syndrome, you have to let others see you. A smile appeared on Willow's face. Sometimes she hated listening to Raymond because he was so well-spoken. He could easily convince her to do anything. Fine. She yielded. Fine, but it has to be somewhere small and quiet. I don't want somewhere with a crowd. Raymond waggled his eyebrows at her. I know just the place. 30 minutes later, they're walking inside a pub. It was small and quaint and Willow felt at ease immediately. They took their seats at a table next to the door and Raymond asked what she wanted to drink. Surprise me. Willow batted her eyelids at him with a playful wink, Raymond said. All right, don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. Alone again, Willow was left to her thoughts. There weren't a lot of people in the pub, but she caught a few people staring at her appreciatively. It made her blush every time. This was such a new experience for her. Hey, beauty. Thinking it was Raymond teasing her as usual, she looked in the direction of the voice with a smile and was surprised to find a stranger, one of the people who had been looking at her. Hey! Can I buy you a drink? The man asked. Willow looked to the bar where she saw Raymond flirting with the female bartender. I actually have company, and he's getting me a drink, but thanks. However, the man persisted. You look like a good drinker, though. How about I buy you a drink? He didn't sound like he was asking, more like he wasn't going to take no for an answer. Willow was starting to feel uneasy. Thanks, but no. She forced a smile on her face, silently hoping he would leave, but that didn't happen. The strange man insists on buying her a drink. You little bitch, you think you're the shit, right? He sneered. Not really, Willow thought inwardly. She was starting to get scared and contemplated calling out to Raymond when a voice interrupted. The lady said no, didn't she? After a long and stressful day at the office, Caspian found himself in a pub. He visited regularly to unwind, nursing his drink, his thoughts still filled with the pending work. Caspian noticed a minor disturbance nearby. The other people around didn't notice, but a visibly intoxicated man seemed to be bothering a woman. An internal voice whispered, Are you going to play the hero again? The rational part of him urged him to leave the situation alone. After all, there were plenty of other people in the pub, and he overheard the woman mention that she was here with someone. But what if she only said that to deter him? He's going to try to take a swing at me, isn't he? Caspian pushed his chair back and strode purposefully toward the scene. Oh, the lady said no, didn't she? Two pairs of eyes turned toward Caspian, and the instigator regarded him with a mixture of annoyance and defiance. What's your problem, buddy? We're just having a good time. Caspian glanced at the woman's scared expression. Though it seems like you're, um, Ilion enjoying yourself here, and she clearly looks uncomfortable. Did she say that? The intoxicated man chuckled and, as expected, took a swing at Caspian. With fast reflexes, Caspian caught the man's hand and deftly twisted it behind his back. Ow! Ow! Stop! That hurts! The man yelped in pain. Caspian maintained his grip, refusing to release the drunk man's arm. He marched towards the pub's exit and forcefully pushed him away once they were outside. Eve or I'll have to call the police? He warned sternly. The intoxicated man responded with a barrage of obscenities and a rude gesture before finally staggering off into the night. And while that goes, any thought of unwinding? With that situation resolved, Caspian was ready to make his way home. However, as he turned to leave, a voice called out to him. Mr. Leroy. Caspian turned around to find the woman from the pub hurrying after him. It didn't surprise him that she recognized him, given that his face often appeared in the media due to his work but her voice held a hint of familiarity. Thank you for helping me back there. He was so persistent. I don't think he would have left without you stepping in. As the woman got closer to Caspian, he got a clearer view of her face. The pub had been a little dark. She wasn't a familiar face, but a passing thought crossed his mind that she was quite pretty. It was nothing. Caspian said and began walking, not waiting for her response. His driver had dropped him off after work and gone ahead, and Caspian didn't live too far from the pub, so he decided to walk home. When? 
What happened? Raymond had just come out of the pub. Willow, still reeling from what just happened, called out. Thank you again, Mr. Leroy. She hadn't expected to be harassed by a drunk patron when she agreed to come out for the night, let alone be rescued by Caspian, but he didn't seem to have recognized her. She didn't know whether to feel happy or sad. Are you okay, Wynn? Is that Caspian Leroy? Raymond pointed in the direction of Caspian's retreating figure. Why is he here? Willow hesitated for a moment before responding. It's a funny story. Do you mind if we just head home? I know you were enjoying your time with the bartender, but I really don't want to go back in there again. Lexi, huh? She's just a really good friend. Raymond replied, though he nodded and added, I'll grab your purse and jacket, say goodbye, and make sure you don't wander off this time. He playfully pointed a stern finger at Willow before rushing back inside the pub. Willow chuckled. Her thoughts went back to Caspian Leroy. It was strange how he suddenly showed up in her life again. What were the odds? In less than a minute, Raymond returned, holding her belongings. Let's go. They decided to walk back home instead of taking a taxi, giving them the chance to chat. So, Raymond began. What happened back at the pub? And Caspian Leroy, what was that about? Willow let out a sigh as she began to recount the evening's events. So, this drunk guy comes up to me, right? And he's offering to buy me a drink, but I'm not interested, but he literally wouldn't take no for an answer. Thankfully, Caspian happened to be in the pub at that moment, and he immediately swooped. Swooped? Raymond interrupted with a laugh. Yes, Ray, swooped. Willow confirmed. He appeared out of nowhere and took a guy out. It was quite attractive. A strange expression briefly crossed Raymond's face, but Willow didn't notice as her attention was fixed on the road. Walking outside for the first time since her accident stirred up a mix of emotions within her. Are you sure you're okay with walking? Raymond, ever observant, had picked up on Willow's discomfort. It's fine. I have to do it eventually. Willow reassured him. She didn't recall much from the day of her accident. Her memory was mostly a blank slate after seeing the speeding car heading toward her. Today doesn't have to be that day. Raymond offered a gentle suggestion. I promise, Ray, it's fine. Willow insisted, casting a sideways glance at her friend. Stop worrying. I'm okay. All right. He conceded and the rest of their walk home was done in silence. Once they got home, Willow asked Raymond if he had to go into work the next day. No, I'll stay back with you. Raymond said, giving Willow a warm look. Should I turn on the television? Willow nodded enthusiastically. I'll grab some snacks. Spending a night watching TV and indulging in unhealthy food with her best friend, nothing sounded better. The next morning, Willow awoke nearly at nine to the doorbell ringing nonstop. Glancing around, she realized Raymond was nowhere to be found. Is he in his room? She got up stretched until she heard a pop and made her way to the door. Swinging it open, she was met with the last person she expected to see at her doorstep, her former boss, Tina. Hello, I'm looking for Willow. After her encounter with Caspian, Willow had figured out that people who knew her before didn't recognize her anymore. Also, due to her massive weight loss, her voice had become lighter. Will, oh, Willow, do you mean the chubby girl who used to live here? An idea formed in Willow's mind. Tina's nodding was frantic. Yes, what do you mean by used to live here? She doesn't stay here anymore. No, that can't happen. Suppressing the smile that threatened to escape, Willow calmly replied, why are you looking for her anyway? She was supposed to work on a project for Leroy Company, but she suddenly didn't show up to work one day. She's not picking up my calls, and I really need to get in contact with her. Tina explained with a frazzled expression. Oh, really? Willow feigned sympathy, though inside, she was laughing at Tina's lie. This woman had fired her and now had the audacity to lie about it. To be honest, we used to be roommates, but she moved out. Willow deadpanned, anything to get her to leave because she wasn't interested in going back to work for Tina. Tina's disappointment was visible as her face fell. Oh, do you have a number I can reach her on? Sorry, no, we weren't exactly close. Willow replied. Oh, I see. Well, if that's all. Willow began to close the door, but Tina reached out a hand to stop it. Wait, please, this is my card. If she ever stops by, could you tell her Tina is trying to reach her? Accepting the card with a somber nod, 
Willow said. Sure, Tina. She then closed the door and collapsed onto the floor in a burst of laughter. Someone's in a good mood. Raymond had come out of his room and was brushing his teeth. Who was at the door? Oh, go! Willow managed to say between giggles, Go spit out what's in your mouth and I'll tell you. As Willow recounted the encounter with Tina to Raymond, he found it amusing but also had an interesting suggestion. What do you think about changing your name? Consider it a fresh start. The only people who know about your plastic surgery and weight loss are the doctors and me. This could be a chance to reinvent yourself. Willow had to admit the idea sounded tempting. A new identity, a clean slate, and the opportunity to break free from the mistakes of her past. Okay, it's a good idea, but what will be my new name? Raymond's eyes sparkled with excitement. How about when? I'm the only one who calls you that. This will be your reinvention. Sitting alone at home, Wynne reflected on the journey she had embarked on, and she couldn't help but feel gratitude for having Raymond by her side. She knew she wouldn't have been able to do it on her own. I'm going to be with you every step of the way, so don't worry, okay? Raymond had reassured her then, and now, it was official. Willow had officially changed her name to Wynne. Two weeks ago, they had visited the courthouse to submit the necessary legal documents and fees for the name change. Raymond had stood by her throughout the court hearing and helped her with the process of updating government and financial records to reflect her new identity. So that was done. Wynne still struggled not to think of herself as Willow. Just yesterday at the coffee shop, she had been waiting to hear Willow, and it wasn't until the server called Wynne a couple times that she realized Raymond had to go into work as usual, and with her job hunt still ongoing, Wynne had plenty of free time during the day. She was browsing through her old design work when she remembered Caspian. Remembering Tina's visit, Wynne had a feeling that the project for Leroy hadn't been done yet. She started to worry about it. Feeling indebted to Caspian for his help at the pub, Wynne believed that helping him with the project at Leroy Company was the least she could do. With this reasoning in mind, she made her way to Leroy Company. Sorry, Mom, you have to have an appointment to see the CEO. The receptionist informed Wynne. Wynne couldn't help but find the situation funny. She had encountered Caspian at a pub randomly, but now, to meet him formally, she needed an appointment. However, she wasn't about to give up. If you tell him it's about the ad for the new diamond collection, I'm sure he'll want to see me. He's not in his office right now. The receptionist Haley, as her name plate indicated, replied with an air of disinterest. Leave your card and I'll give it to him. Did you say something about an ad for a new diamond collection? A new voice joined the conversation, causing Wynne to turn around. A man in his late thirties, sporting a striking red suit, was standing behind her. Mmm. Hi. I'm Wynne. She introduced herself. He extended his hand, and she shook it. Miss Wynne, I'm Jerry, the director of the design department. I think you should talk to me. I can't stay long, but this is what I've worked on. Wynne replied, handing him the USB drive containing the ad. Caspian, I mean, Mr. Leroy liked it. Jerry arched a questioning eyebrow. Well, what is it? Well, Leroy Company is planning to launch a new diamond collection, right? That USB contains the ad design for it. Wynne explained. Oh, and Caspian is aware that you worked on this? Jerry inquired. Well, kind of. Anyway, I worked on this for the project, and it's only right I let him have it. Wynne replied. Okay, can I have your card in case I need to contact you? Wynne shook her head. I don't have a card now, but... She turned to the receptionist and requested. Can I have a piece of paper and a pen? When Haley provided her with the materials, Wynne quickly scribbled her phone number on it. This is the number you can reach me on. All right. Jerry began to say, but Wynne was already walking away. Just as she was about to step out of the company building, her phone pinged with an alert. She glanced at her phone to see that the celebrity news website she followed on social media had just posted an article. As she read the post, Wynne's phone nearly slipped from her grasp. The headline read, Caspian Leroy and Giselle Spark Dating Rumors After Lunch Date. Attached to the headline was a picture of Caspian and Giselle, an upcoming actress, seated at what appeared to be a restaurant. Caspian was leaning in close to Giselle and looked like he had been about to kiss her when the picture was taken. A gasp escaped Wynne's mouth as she processed the unexpected news. Without wasting any time, 
She quickly flagged down a taxi and made her way back home, her mind racing with questions and emotions about the photograph she had just seen. Miss, you can't go in there. Caspian's secretary cautioned, but it was too late. An enraged Dizelle stormed into Caspian's office and tossed a newspaper onto his desk. Caspian, what is this? Caspian glanced at the newspaper, remembering the situation that caused this whole misunderstanding. The Airway Company would like you to be the face of the new collection we want to launch. Just last week, Caspian had met with Giselle for business purposes. The actress was rapidly gaining popularity and had managed to stay clear of any scandals, making her an ideal choice for enhancing the company's image. Does Leroy Company not have someone in their marketing department to do this? Giselle inquired arching a perfectly shaped eyebrow at Caspian. It was unusual for the CEO of such a prestigious company to personally handle business deals like this. They were inside a quiet and mostly empty restaurant. Well, as much as I can, I like to get involved. Caspian responded. Giselle nodded in understanding. Caspian, can I call you that? Or would you prefer something more professional? Anything is fine. Caspian replied stoically. All right, Caspian, it is. Why me? Gazelle pressed. You have everything we need. Caspian stated simply. She waited, expecting Caspian to elaborate further, but he remained silent. Since you came to me personally, I can't exactly reject your offer, can I? You can, but I just need to check something. Caspian said, producing an item from his pocket. He held a diamond necklace and inquired. Uh, can I? He leaned over Gazelle and delicately placed the necklace around her neck. Looks good on you. Are you ready to sign the contract? Giselle was momentarily lost for words as Caspian's unexpected closeness took her by surprise. Her heart fluttered, but Caspian either didn't notice or chose to ignore the effect he had on her. He smoothly pushed the contract towards her, waiting for her to sign. With a nod, Giselle finally regained her composure and reached for the pen. With the contract signed and sealed, Caspian gestured to Giselle, saying, You don't have to leave just yet, or anything you want. It's on me. Afterward, he excused himself and left. That was the extent of their interaction, but somehow, the pictures circulating on social media painted a different picture, making it seem as though they had been on a date. Now, in the present, Giselle was furious and didn't even bother to take a seat. The contract states that a party can file for termination if the other party does something defamatory. She reminded Caspian, her anger evident. Miss Giselle, please calm down. Caspian urged, recognizing the need to defuse the situation. Technically, this wasn't the fault of the company, but he realized there were various potential outcomes to this scenario and had to ensure it didn't lead to the termination of their agreement. Believe me, this is a good thing. Gazelle shot him an angry look. Do tell me how this is a good thing, Caspian? Um, it's quite simple. Caspian began to explain. People love drama, especially drama between couples. For the next month or so, all eyes will be on us. Consider it from a new perspective. Potential hires think we're a couple, and many people try to win my favor, which means they'll do the same for you. Just give it a few days, and you'll be receiving calls from numerous directors eager to cast you in their projects. Dizelle had calmed down, but she still regarded Caspian with a somewhat distrustful gaze as she pondered his words. What does Leroy Company gain in all of this? Caspian stood up and approached her. People paying more attention to you means people paying more attention to us. Your fans will want to start buying our products. Everybody wins. Is it really that simple? She asked. Caspian remained standing in front of her and affirmed. It is. Um, and it'll be just for a little while. Back at home, Wynne was ready to drown her frustration in a bucket of ice cream. Obsessively, she had gone through every comment under the post about Caspian and Gazelle. I totally shipped these two. Of course, a beautiful man should date an equally beautiful woman. Couple goals. Those were the majority of the comments, and it left Wynne feeling a little mad. It was just a random picture that could have been fabricated, but the public was eating it up, and that pissed her off. Just then, the door opened and Raymond walked in. Who made you mad? She showed him the post. Unbelievable, right? They're cute. Raymond commented. Wynne felt a sense of betrayal. It's not real. You don't know that, Wynne. Raymond replied before heading to the fridge for a drink of water. He really looks like he was about to kiss her. You don't know that, Wynne shouted in frustration. Hua, who, who? Raymond raised his hands in surrender. Let's say you're right. Why do you even care anyway? You won't understand. Wynne replied, growing increasingly agitated. 
Ignoring Raymond's calls, she abruptly grabbed her phone and a jacket and stormed out of the house. As wind stormed out, her phone buzzed with calls from Raymond, so she put it on silent, tightened her jacket around herself, and began the walk to the pub. She knew she had overreacted, but the events of the day had left her feeling frustrated in ways she couldn't fully understand. Caspian had stood up for her twice now when nobody else would, first at work and then at the pub. She couldn't deny that she had developed feelings for him. Frustration boiled within her as she tried to shake off thoughts of Caspian and Giselle being a couple. Wynne ran a hand through her hair and let out a silent, frustrated scream, continuing her walk. As she neared the pub, she spotted a couple kissing on a street corner. Wynne resisted the urge to roll her eyes, only to arrive at the pub and find it closed. This time she screamed out loud, attracting looks from Passersby. Can I just stay here all night? She muttered to herself, knowing it wasn't possible. Forget it. She was going back home. She flagged down a taxi, wanting to avoid the risk of seeing the kissing couple again. When Wynne returned home, she found Raymond pacing outside their shared apartment. Where have you been? He inquired, his tone carrying a hint of anger. I just went out. Wynne replied nonchalantly and tried to walk past him, but he grabbed her arm and pulled her back. It wasn't a rough grab, so she didn't fight it. Why didn't you pick up your phone? I've been calling you. He said, his worry and hurt becoming more evident. It was only then that Wynne looked into Raymond's eyes and realized how concerned he was. I'm sorry for worrying you, Ray. I just needed to clear my head. Without saying a word, Raymond pulled her into a comforting hug, and Wynne relaxed into it. Raymond was her only ally, the only person she could rely on at the moment, and she didn't want to push him away. She couldn't afford to lose him. I'm sorry, Ray. It's okay, Wynn. You've been under a lot of stress lately. Vent all you want. He reassured her. He was always trying to comfort her even when she was in the wrong. They stood in the hug for a while until Wynn began to feel the chill. Hey, Ray. Do you mind letting me go so we don't freeze to death? She joked. Raymond laughed, patted her head affectionately, and released her. Let's go up. That night, they didn't watch television or indulge in junk food together. After returning to their apartment, they both retired to their respective rooms. Winnie lay on her bed, her gaze fixed on the ceiling, her mind swirling with thoughts of Caspian. Eventually, she turned to her laptop and began searching for job openings at Leroy Company. As luck would have it, there was an opening for the position of assistant to the CEO. Without giving it a second thought, she submitted her application and received an email almost immediately, inviting her for an interview the following day. She went to bed with a smile on her face, and when she woke up the next day, her smile was even brighter. Today marked the beginning of her journey to get closer to Caspian, and she had a good feeling about it. As she left her room, she found Raymond having breakfast. You're up early, he commented. I have an interview today, Wynne replied, moving to prepare herself a smoothie. That's great. Raymond sounded genuinely excited for her. At which company? Leroy. She answered, studying his reaction, but his expression turned unreadable. Good luck. I'll be heading to the hospital now. How about meeting at the pub later tonight? Raymond suggested. Wynne nodded and replied. Sure. And drank her smoothie as she practiced answering interview questions online. Afterward, she took a shower and carefully selected her outfit. Finding the right attire was a challenge. She wanted something that would catch Caspian's attention, shallow as it may sound. Eventually, she settled on the perfect look, a green satin blouse paired with a gray pencil skirt and nude block heels. She added some light makeup and curled her hair for the finishing touch. Wynne opted to take a taxi to the company to avoid arriving in a sweaty mess. The receptionist, Haley, recognized her, and her demeanor was noticeably warmer this time. Miss Wynne, you're here for the interview, right? Wynne responded with a bright smile, saying, Yes. Take the elevator to the third floor. Mr. Leroy's office is the only one on the floor. Acknowledging her with a brisk nod, Wynne entered the elevator. As she waited to reach her destination, she smoothed down her clothes and checked her teeth in the mirror. All good! She affirmed with a confident smile, just as the elevator doors opened on the third floor. Hello, I'm Wynne. I'm here for the interview with Mr. Leroy. Wynne introduced herself to the secretary, who promptly made a call. Afterward, the secretary directed Wynne to proceed inside. Thank you. Feeling a sudden surge of nervousness, Wynne took careful steps until she stood in front of a door bearing the label Caspian Leroy, CEO. 
Inhaling deeply, she knocked and gently pushed the door open. Caspian was standing and gazing out the window when she entered. He turned around, momentarily surprised at seeing the woman from the pub, but quickly regaining his composure. Miss Wynn, please have a seat. He instructed, gesturing to a chair. She complied. Um, I reviewed your resume and it seems to be quite sparse. You're what, 21? 22? What experience do you have? I've dabbled in design and I'm a fast learner. Wynn replied with a smile, trying to sound confident. Caspian didn't appear convinced at all. Um, uh, why isn't that mentioned on, on your resume? He asked, his tone probing. Winnick couldn't very well admit that she had worked at Tina's company, as that would give her away. She settled on saying, It wasn't official work, sir. Caspian gave a slow nod of his head. Need to avoid wasting any more of our time. I'm afraid I'll have to reject your application. However, I'll, I'll, I'll offer you a word of advice. Build up your resume before considering applying to a company like Leroy. You're dismissed. With those words, Wynne's dreams were shattered before they even had a chance to take shape. She tried to protest, her smile slipping. But can I? No. Caspian interrupted sternly. You shouldn't have even received an interview invitation. If you'll excuse me, I have a lot of work to attend to. His gaze shifted toward the door, signaling that the interview was over. At this point, she had completely lost her smile. Hours after returning home, Wynne remained in a state of despair her eyes red and swollen. An almost empty bottle of scotch sat on the table, a testament to her attempt to drown her sorrows. With her heavy heart, she sent a message to Raymond. Let's hang out at home today. I don't feel like going out today. Hours passed before Raymond responded with a simple okay. By 10 p.m., Wynne was completely drunk, unable to even stand up. Her phone played a playlist of sad songs that she sang along to, her voice wavering and out of tune. When Raymond arrived home and found her in such a sorry state, he was taken aback. What the hell happened? He exclaimed, sitting down beside her on the floor. Caspian, rude. Wynne slurred, her speech incoherent. Her brain was fogged by alcohol, making it difficult for her to form clear sentences. Raymond's concern grew as he asked. Wynne, how much did you drink? Wynne repeated. Caspian and then shocked Raymond by leaning closer and planting her lips on his in a drunken kiss. Wynne woke up the next day with a pounding headache, her memory of the previous night hazy. She couldn't recall walking to her room, but that's where she found herself upon waking. On the table beside her bed, Raymond, bless his heart, had left a glass of water and some aspirin, with a note instructing her to take them and have a bath. After the hot bath, she left her room in a robe, meeting Raymond just as he was preparing to leave for work. You're up? I didn't want to disturb you in case you were still sleeping. A sheepish smile formed on Wynne's face. Thanks for the aspirin. Just how much did I drink last night? Her memories after she came home were non-existent. When I came back, you were so drunk you couldn't even stand on your own. I had to carry you inside. Wynne tapped her forehead as she struggled to recall the events of the previous night. Oh, I don't remember anything. Raymond's voice carried a questioning tone as he asked. At all? Yeah, the last thing I remember is getting back home. Everything after that is a blur. She noticed that Raymond wasn't making eye contact, which raised her suspicions. Are you sure nothing happened last night? Raymond finally met her eyes, but stammered. Why? Why do you ask? Wynne waved her hand dismissively and said, Oh, never mind. She would drop the topic for now. Just then, her phone began to ring from the room. I'll go get that. Her head was still pounding as she answered the call. Hello? Hello, Miss Wynne. This is the hiring department of Leroy Company. Wynne's eyes widened in surprise. Yes? We would like to congratulate you on your acceptance into the company. When can you start? Wynne was in shock, but she still had the right mind to reply. Tomorrow's fine. She couldn't very well go in today hungover. All right, all right. The voice on the phone replied. We'll be expecting you tomorrow. Congratulations once again. As she hung up, Wynne let out an excited scream of joy that brought Raymond rushing to her room. What? What happened? I got the job. She screamed again and ran into Ray's arms. He welcomed her with a hug until he remembered she was only wearing a robe, and he pushed her away with a guilty look. Congratulations, Wynne. He said, giving her an awkward pat on the head. You deserved it. I can't believe I'm going to be working with Caspian Leroy. 
I'm so excited, Ray. I wish I could go in today. She groaned, remembering her hangover. Why did I drink so much yesterday? Oh, wait, don't you have to go to work? Yes, I do. But when, please don't ever drink alone or in the presence of someone other than me going forward. You have a blank memory because of yesterday, and it could be dangerous if it happened with someone else. Promise me that. Wynne rolled her eyes but eventually promised. I won't, okay? Now leave before you're late for work. He gave her a small smile and left. Wynne flopped back onto her bed, excited about what tomorrow would bring. She was going to work for Caspian. Another squeal escaped her lips. Ow, my head. That day passed by as an excited blur. Wynne couldn't remember if she ate or what she did, just thoughts of what tomorrow would bring. The next day Wynne woke up full of excitement. She rummaged through her closet for the perfect outfit, settling on a black suit with nude heels, but as she entered the Leroy building with confidence, her expectations were immediately shattered. Jerry, the man she had met before, was waiting for her, and he claimed she now worked for him. I don't understand. I got a phone call yesterday saying I got the job. Jerry nodded, his corporate smile in place. Today, he was dressed in a white suit and white shoes. The other day, he'd been dressed in a red suit. He seemed like the type that loved attention. You got the job. You'll be working under me. When his heart shattered into a million pieces, this was not what she had expected at all. The ad you worked on was amazing, and the design department would like to have you on our team. Wynne couldn't believe her luck. She had hoped to get closer to Caspian, but now she was working for Jerry instead. Right there, she made the decision to make the most of this unexpected turn of events. Sure, she missed out on the opportunity to work directly with Caspian, but she was determined to make her mark and get him to notice her. Jerry beamed at her and shook her hand. Lovely. Now if you'll follow me. The last time Wynne was here for the interview with Caspian, she had been directed to the third floor, this time with Jerry. They went to the second floor. When they got off the elevator, Jerry gave her a tour. The planning department is over there, and the marketing department is this way. This is our stop, the design department. Trust me, all the people here are mostly friendly. You'll fit right in. Wynne wasn't sure of that as she'd never been able to fit in, but it was a little exciting even if it wasn't what she had been expecting. She thought to herself, You may not be Caspian's assistant, but you're one step closer to working beside him. Prove yourself here until he can't ignore you anymore. You can do this, Wynne. In the room, as they entered, there were six other people. Jerry, with a welcoming gesture, proceeded to perform swift introductions. Everyone, meet Wynne, the latest addition to our team. Wynne, this is Olivia, who will be your supervisor. The rest, Anna, Jean, Mitchell, Luke, and Edward. He announced, associating each name with a point of his finger. I trust you all will assist Wynne in getting used to our environment. With that, he vanished into what appeared to be his office, and Wynne didn't see him until later in the day. Wynne raised her hand in a friendly wave, but to her surprise, her new co-workers walked away without acknowledging her. Slightly flustered, she turned to Olivia, who was regarding her with an unreadable expression. A sense of deja vu crept in, and Wynne wondered if this would be a Tina 2.0. Olivia? Pointing a perfectly manicured finger towards an unoccupied desk, said simply, Take a seat there. All right. Wynne could hear the warning bells going off in her head, but whatever. If Olivia wanted her to just sit there, she would sit there perfectly. A while later, when Wynne made her way to the restroom, she overheard a conversation about herself. What's the deal with a new girl? She's just a pretty face. Why did Jerry hire her? I know, right? Maybe she slept with him. I didn't think he was into women. They both laughed like it was the funniest thing. Wynne couldn't differentiate their voices yet. They'd communicated with her with gestures so far. She thought about walking in, but not wanting to make it more awkward. She went back to her seat. Two people walked out of the restroom a few seconds later, and Wynne was able to identify them as Michelle, with the red hair, and Jean, who wore her curly hair in two buns. For the sake of peace, she was going to pretend like she hadn't heard them. Later, when Jerry came out of his office, he approached Wynne. Please take this to the CO and get him to sign it. His office is on the third floor, the only one there. Jerry, why are you sending the newbie? I can do it. It's fine, Olivia. Let Wynne do it. As Wynne stood from her seat, she didn't miss the glare Olivia sent her way. This really was Tina 2.0. Okay, Jerry. 
When she got out of the elevator, she greeted the secretary and told her what she was there for. The secretary called Caspian and told him someone from the design department was there to see him. Go on in. This is even more nerve-wracking than last time. Wynne thought to herself as she mustered the courage to push the CEO's office door open. Gathering her thoughts, she began. Jerry asked me to... Caspian cut her off abruptly, his tone cold. Stop, why are you here? Stammering, Wynne tried to explain. Ah, uh, Jerry sent me. Annoyed, he waved his hand around. No, why are you here? In this building? I told you that you didn't get the job. Flustered, Wynne tried to mention that Jerry had hired her, but Caspian's curt response threw her off. Get out. Feeling utterly disheartened by the exchange, Wynne left Caspian's office and conveyed Caspian's message to Jerry upon her return to the office. He wants you in his office. She informed Jerry before retreating to her desk. As she sat down, she couldn't help but question why she was even there. Her co-workers didn't like her. Her supervisor didn't like her either. As the weight of the situation settled in, Wynne wanted to call it a day. No had become Olivia's favorite word to use when addressing Wynne, closely followed by, You can't do it, can you? Many times, Wynne had been on the verge of picking up her things and walking out, but the reality was she needed a job to afford a roof over her head. Even though Raymond was nice about it, she didn't want to prey on his kindness. On the bright side, she had become friends with one of her co-workers, Anna, who often helped Wynne whenever she was facing challenges. Olivia's words had brought Wynne in back to the present. It was a daily occurrence for Olivia to criticize something Wynne did, and this was the fifth reprimand of the day. Winnie, can't you do something right for once? You can't do it, can you? Olivia's voice echoed with frustration. Wynne had learned not to respond when Olivia launched into one of her tirades. In the beginning, she had tried to defend herself, but it had never ended well for her. Now she knew to remain quiet until Olivia was satisfied. After Olivia returned to her own work, Anna approached Wynne at her desk with a reassuring smile. Remember, don't let it get to you. We all faced the same challenges when we first arrived. She didn't have any experience in diamond design, but she was willing to learn. Her love for diamonds was the second reason she stayed. Plus, seeing the work her co-workers did inspired her to work harder. We're leaving. Hearing Anna's voice, Wynne glanced up to find her standing with Luke, who she had learned was Anna's boyfriend. She had been so immersed in her work that she hadn't realized time had passed. The office was empty except for the three of them. You were so engrossed in that. Anna remarked with a warm smile. You're doing great, all right? Anna was a petite woman, and Luke had a big stature, so they made for a pretty unique couple. Thanks, Anna. Bye, Luke. Wynne bid farewell to the couple, acknowledging Luke, who rarely talked with anyone other than Anna. Get home safely. You should leave soon. Sure. I just have a little to finish up. Rising from her desk, where she had spent hours working, Wynne stretched and made her way to the vending machine to grab a cup of coffee. She didn't want to leave work without completing her current tasks. It's almost 10 p.m. Wino noted as she glanced at her wristwatch. Just a few more minutes and she would call it a day. Standing at the vending machine with her back turned to the entrance, she picked up the hot cup of coffee. Then, unexpectedly, a voice called out. Jerry. The cup of coffee slipped from Wynne's, and she jumped away just in time to avoid being scalded. Shit! That was close. A concerned voice reached her ears. Are you okay? Did that get your leg? Recognizing the voice, Wynne turned around with a nervous squeak. Sir? He inquired, pointing at the coffee spill. Caspian raised an eyebrow, his attention now on the mess on the floor. No, it's fine, sir. Wynne assured him before hastily making her way to the supply room to fetch a mop. When she returned, Caspian was casually looking around the office. Do you need something, sir? Caspian's gaze shifted to her. Has Jerry gone home? Uncertain, Wynne knocked on Jerry's office door. I think so, sir. Caspian made to leave, but Wynne stopped him with a question. Did you need something, sir? He initially responded with a no, no, and proceeded to walk away, but he slipped, and the papers in his hand scattered to the ground. Wynne rushed to his side. Are you okay, sir? Caspian waved off her concern. Fine, fine. As Wynne bent down to help him gather the scattered papers, she couldn't help but notice the contents. For the Valentine's Day promo, you're only targeting couples. Caspian snatched the papers from her hand, appearing uninterested. Nice, why? 
Wynne hesitated briefly before explaining. Couples aren't the only ones who celebrate Valentine's Day. Singles, divorced individuals, widows, and other groups also celebrate it. Caspian raised an eyebrow. And? Well, how about not restricting it to couples, but being more inclusive of those other groups? It'll have a significant impact on sales. Caspian had to admit that it was a solid suggestion. Thank you. That's a, that's a pretty good idea. I didn't think of that. I'll make sure to pass it on to the team. He watched as her eyes widened in disbelief. You're actually going with that? Uh, why not? You know, I'm... Caspian replied. He would have to bring it up with the planning department and marketing department, but it sounded like a solid plan. Wynne stammered slightly, clearly taken aback. We... well... Would you like to join the production department? She could be a valuable addition to the team. Her eyes widened even further if that was possible. Wow. Thank you, sir. But this department is kind of growing on me. I've loved diamonds since I was a little girl, but it's my first time being involved in designing one, so it's both frightening and interesting. If you don't mind, I would love to stay here. Caspian gave a brisk nod. He appreciated her approach to work. Good. It's late you should leave. He said simply. And with that, he left. Raymond was possibly losing his mind. What else could explain the fact that he kept thinking about his best friend in a not-so-sisterly way? Tried as he could to shake her off his mind, he couldn't, and what happened a few nights ago made it near impossible to do so. He'd even resorted to sleeping at the hospital to avoid seeing Wynne. Wynne had been his best friend since they were kids, and Raymond could confidently say that they were close and told each other everything. He told her about the women he hooked up with, she told him about the men she fell in love with every week that had been normal for them. But Raymond had a sinking feeling inside him that this time she was serious about being in love. And it didn't make him feel good. Raymond was struggling. He couldn't stop thinking about when, when he closed his eyes, all he could see was the kiss. It was driving him crazy, and he knew he had to do something about it before it affected his work. Mr. Raymond, you may go in. The receptionist said, bringing him back to reality. His only choice now was to talk to someone about it, but he couldn't very well share it with his win, could he? So, he decided to book an earlier appointment with his therapist. Raymond, good morning. It's good to see you. Our next appointment wasn't supposed to be until next week, so something must have happened. Dr. Theresa greeted him with a warm smile. Yeah. Can you fill me in? While reclining on the couch with his eyes shut, thoughts of Wynne filled his mind. Without opening his eyes, he said, She kissed me. Win, my best friend. Dr. Theresa responded with contemplative, um sounds as she jotted something down in her notebook. She then returned her gaze to Raymond and inquired, And how did that make you feel? With his eyes still shut, Raymond sat up and shared, She was drunk when it happened. The next day, she didn't remember. But it's been all I can think of. Dr. Theresa emitted another thoughtful hum. So, if I understand correctly, Win. Your best friend kissed you, and you haven't been able to get the thought of it off your mind? Raymond sighed in frustration, finally opening his eyes. Yes. And how has this impacted your work? Has it affected your ability to focus on your work? Raymond remained silent. Raymond, I need to know. He shook his head and admitted, I can push her to the back of my mind while I'm working, but when I'm idle, she dominates my thoughts. Dr. Theresa jotted down notes and asked further, and how does this make you feel? That's why I'm here. Raymond, may I be honest with you? Dr. Theresa set her notebook aside, focusing entirely on Raymond. Correct me if I'm mistaken, but in all the years I've been your therapist, you've rarely discussed when in this way. Our conversations have revolved around your addiction, your career, but when has come up only in passing. Did something happen between you two? About two hours later, Raymond returned home to find that Wynne was absent. At the end of the session, Dr. Teresa had said something that shocked him. Raymond, we don't have enough time to talk about this today. But I think concerning Wynne, these feelings may have come up because you feel your relationship is being threatened or because you're in love with her. Scrubbing his face with his hand, Raymond pushed his hair out of his face and groaned, in love with Wynne, not possible. They'd been friends for years and this had never happened before. Or was Dr. Derisa right? And it was because he felt their relationship was being threatened. The only person he could think of was... Wynne, are you free right now? Can you come over? Jerry came over to Wynne's desk. 
Today, the older man was donning a purple suit. Wynne had quickly realized that Jerry loved his suits, and he probably had a million of them. He wore a different color every day and she had never seen him repeat a suit. Was this normal for rich people? Wynne. Wynne. The professional smile was back on Jerry's face. I have good news. He handed her a file, which she began to go through. Remember the uh, the proposal you gave me the first time we met? Winnie didn't want to get her hopes up, but if this were true, then Jerry confirmed her thoughts. We have been given the go-ahead to begin filming. The file slipped from Wynne's hand and landed on the desk. With wide eyes, she glanced to the side, where Anna gave her a thumbs up. Thank you. She mouthed to her friend and then turned her attention back to Jerry. Wow, Jerry. Thank you so much. No need for that. Anyway, Caspian, that is, Mr. Leroy has asked that you go to the filming site with Olivia. Wynne shuddered as she turned toward Olivia, and as expected, the other woman was glaring at her, giving Olivia a nervous smile. She quickly looked away. Forget about her, Wynne. You worked for this, and you deserve to witness this. Wynne gave herself a pep talk and refocused on Jerry. Thank you so much, Jerry. As Raymond's phone rang loudly, shattering the silence around him, he reached into his pocket to take it out and glanced at the caller ID. Talk about perfect timing. Hey, when? I got it. Leroy Company. Can you stop obsessing over him? There was anger in Raymond's voice. Caspian is in a relationship, Wynne, so just let it go. With that, he hung up, leaving Wynne staring at her phone in disbelief. What just happened? She didn't have time to ponder over it because Anne walked into the restroom at that moment. Winnie, you need to get out there. I think Olivia is planning to leave without you. Thanks, Anna, she said and exited the restroom. Sure enough, Olivia was nowhere to be seen. Wynne quickly hurried down to the parking lot, where she found Olivia about to drive off in her car. She waved at her, and luckily, Olivia didn't run her down, even though it seemed like she wanted to. I'm sorry. I had to go to the restroom. Wynne apologized as she got into the car. Olivia pressed the lock on the doors, not even sparing her a glance. As she buckled her seatbelt, Wynne found out the hard way that Olivia was a reckless driver, and on numerous occasions during the ride, she had to hold on to the grab handle. If she didn't know any better, she would think Olivia was trying to kill her, but the other woman didn't spare her a glance the entire ride. When they finally reached the filming site without any scratches, thank goodness, Olivia proceeded to ignore her. When Wynne asked what she could do, Olivia just waved her off. The model is on her way. She called to apologize and said there's a bit of traffic. The director called out, waving her phone in the air. Then, she resumed her conversation with the producer. Olivia stood next to them, listening in on their conversation. Since Wynne didn't have anything specific to do, she went around checking on the props, the filming crew, and everything else. A few minutes later, the model arrived and Olivia rushed to meet her asking about her drive down there. Gazelle, who was modeling the diamonds, gave monosyllabic replies and looked around. She had a few questions of her own. Did you check the clothes for dust? I can't wear them if they have even a speck of dust. Olivia looked confused. What are you talking about? Looking unimpressed, Gazelle said. The clothes and the diamonds. Make sure none of them have dust on them. But we have to start filming now. Olivia spluttered. She hadn't been informed she was going to be dealing with a diva. I won't wear them then. Gazelle wore a defiant look as she stared back at Olivia. Wynne, overhearing their conversation, rushed over. What just happened? She asked aloud, only then noticing that Olivia was standing there, fuming. Miss Gazelle, I've informed the stylist about your allergy. Everything will be cross-checked beforehand. Wynne might have done a bit of research on Giselle when the news came out about her and Caspian, discovering that Giselle had a dust allergy. Turning to face Wynne, Giselle asked, What's your name? Wynne. You'll be my assistant for the duration of filming. Giselle walked off before Wynne could react, leaving her in shock. 